Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled to get past your jumbled mind, then do we have the get out of your mind and get things done show for you. Today I'll be talking with David Allen, author, consultant, international lecturer, and the best-selling author of numerous books, including his international bestseller, Getting Things Done. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about creating more room in our minds, getting in control, and getting things done. That plus we'll talk about ants and pheromones, tantrums and six-month-olds, ideas bouncing like pinballs, waiting tables and French restaurants, and what in the world Mrs. Williams and fourth grade frogs has to do with anything. <laughs> gotcha. So welcome back to the show, David. Are you ready to shine? Hey, delighted to be here. Yay. Thanks. Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, and the last time, and, and people can catch that on, on the re-air, we're over a thousand shows in now, um, they can catch the whole David Allen 101. I want to dive straight into things, maybe the, the get to the heart of the matter. Why can't we trust our minds? Your mind didn't evolve to remember, remind, or prioritize, or manage relationships uh, with more than four things. It does that very well, by the way. Ooh, there's a, my, my kid's crying. There's a thunderstorm. There's a snake over there. Might be a bear up there. I'm hungry. And that's about it. And it does that extremely well. So anybody listening or watching this right now is doing this right now. You're using long-term uh, history and pattern recognition to say, well, that's a screen. That's a computer. That's a person. That's a whatever. And computers can't even do that yet. So your brain evolved to do some very cool things to keep you alive. You know, so you could recognize patterns that worked and didn't work and how to uh, arrange them. It did not evolve to remember, remind, or prioritize more than like four things in terms of history and what you need to remember to remind yourself to remember to remind yourself to do. And so we've entered a whole new world, especially for knowledge workers, where your work is not self-evident and not obvious in front of you. You know, there's no pattern recognition for an email other than, oh, geez, that's an email. <laughs> you actually have to open the email and find the snake or the thunderstorm or the berry inside the email. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's now a, there's a whole new demand, you know, from the last hundred years anyway, that your brain is not evolved to handle very well. I like thinking in terms of computers. And when you talk about all these demands, like you have to open up an email, to me, it sounds like what you're talking about is we've overwhelmed our desktop. Well, you're overwhelmed potential meaning. It's not, you know, come on, you, I, I've met people with, you know, 45 little icons on their desktop, and that's fine. They're just not overwhelmed with that. That's just kind of their reference system. The problem is, is when there's things lurking inside of those 45 little icons on your desktop yeah. that you still need to think about, decide about, decide that something to do with, evaluate that against all the other stuff that you need to do, and then you're buried, then, then, then you're in overwhelm. And so, yeah, so it, it <clears throat> the digital world has made it... Mm, it, there's nothing different. If you if you have more to do than you can possibly do in the moment you think of it, then you need this methodology to, in order to keep your head clear. The what the digital world has done is is offer a whole lot more stuff that's thrown at you about which you think you might need to think about, decide something about, do something about. And that's that's what that's really what's different. So and that that gets to a lot of your methodology of getting things down so that you don't have it on the desktop. When a few years ago, I guess you were very overwhelmed. You're asking, what's the best way to plan? You went in search of what's called a master planner. What is our master planner? Well, your head's a master planner. Your, your brain is brilliant. You're planning. You plan just what to say right now, Michael. You're planning what to wear. You're planning. You, you, you can't stop planning if I ask you to stop planning. You plan how to do that. So I, I looked around for the best planner in the world because I couldn't. You know, as I was, you know, moving into my own consulting and, 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 and coaching practices, you know, I was working with a lot of people who were in project planning or project management and so forth. And I tried to look around and say, well, what's the best project planning model? Because I'd, I've never had any traditional business or time management or project planning course in my life. Uh, but I said, the best way to learn how to plan is find who's the best planner <laughs> and see how they do that. Right. But there was no plan. There was no planning template or model that I could see that anybody was using universally. So I, just, I don't know. I don't know if it was two days or two weeks or two months. I was scratching my head. Called, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, there's got to be something universal about this. And I came up with the big aha. Wait a minute. We're planning all the time. So how do we do that? How does your brain plan what to wear, what to say, where to go, what 
to do. It's doing it all the time. And I, I just recognized, I didn't make it up. I just recognized the five stage model we all go through, you know, to get sort of anything figured out in terms of what am I going to do about this? That's why I call it the natural planning model because we're doing it naturally. So what can you tell us about that? And, and is a six month old really planning? Oh yeah. As soon as they throw a tantrum, what do you think? They want something they can't get and they have figured out the best way to do that is scream, right? Because that works, <laughs> right? So anybody who's ever, you know, uh, experienced kids, you know, doing behaviors, they're doing those behaviors because those behaviors worked at some point, right? Hey, I want something. I don't have it. How do I get it? So they're doing that already. I mean, I, I, it's probably not real adult or conscious about that, but it is, that's already going on. And their forebrain, you know, the, the, the frontal cortex actually starts to develop at about six months where I, the frontal cortex is the part of you that has a vision of something you want <clears throat> that you can't have right now or that you, <clears throat> that you don't have right now. So it's good that you, it's cool that you pointed out the word vision. In fact, let's dive into the model. Maybe you can tell us part number one of the model purpose. Yeah. Well, what's the intention? See, if you want to get dressed, right? <laughs> That's what got you dressed. Is some part of you says, "I don't want to show up naked in this uh, in this show, <clears throat> right? I want to be dressed, right?" So you have an intention. The intention is what triggers the natural planning model. Mm -hmm. So the purpose. Why are you doing this? What's the purpose for this? So that's a, there's a purpose for going out to dinner. There's a purpose for you know you got some purpose that got you doing anything. I'm 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 hungry. I want to feed my face. I, I you know whatever. So purpose is first. That's the first thing. And also tied to that are your values and your standards. That as you think, you don't think about your values, you think within them. You know, Can you, you, you explain you, that more? Yeah, well, when you decided what to put on, yeah. you didn't put on a bikini. You didn't, you know, you didn't put on, you know, whatever, because some party says that's uncool or that's not my standard. So, you, so, so the options you were choosing from all fit within some sort of standard of what does Michael Sandler look like, right? On the, on the on the on the tube, right? So so your purpose and principles are the core drivers of your thinking, your natural planning, and then you then you have a picture. Hey, what would I look like if I was wildly successful dressing myself? <laughs> right? So you did some version of that. You know, it looked cool to me. I mean, yeah, fine. Well, thank you. But that was a, that was your own that was your own sense of okay. Here's how I need to look ultimately yep. in some way, and so you have a vision. So, because a lot of people could have the same purpose about something, but have very different visions of what it would look like if that purpose were being fulfilled, right? <clears throat> so, you know, some sexy lady might want to look like a very different thing, given, you know, her uh, YouTube or his YouTube could be a man or a woman, either one. Uh, but their vision of being, you know, sort of perfectly dressed might look very different than yours. So <clears throat> then you have a vision. Once you have that vision, if, if you're not already dressed that way, some party says, wait a minute, there's a delta between how I'm currently dressed and how I want to be dressed. So, so then you, so first is the why. Well, I need to get dressed. Then the, the what, and I think I need to look like X, Y, and Z. And then there's the how, but how comes in two parts. There's a part A and a part B. The first how is you're starting to, as soon as you have a vision that's not true yet, your brain goes, wait a minute, what are all the things that might be relevant to this? Uh, I need to put on a shirt. I need to find, is that the right color? I don't need it. And then you do basically what people call brainstorming, which is the brain is trying to generate or capture or identify all potentially relevant stuff. Mm -hmm. Little, big, it doesn't matter. They show up in somewhat random order. And that's where brainstorming comes in, is how do I start to relieve the pressure of the delta between my vision and where I currently am? Yeah. Right? And that's part A. But then you start to say, well, I could dress like this. I could dress, I've got a polo shirt. I could do, but is that colors Does that match the, my background with my, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Then at a certain point you go, okay, then there's how part B. Okay. Given all that, first I need to put on my pants and then I need to pick the shirt. And then I need to, in other words, now you start to structure or organize. So the, 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 essentially the, the fourth step is just organize, organizing the potentially random and potentially meaningful stuff either in terms of sequences or, or components or priorities. Here's the three things I need to put on today. Uh, you know, shoes, socks, shirt, pants could be priority. You know, the main thing is I want a shirt that looks right in terms of color against all this. 
Uh, or it could be just a sequence of events. First I need to, then I need to, then I need to, then I need to, or some combination of all those three. And that's how people then organize. So we've got the why, we've got the what, we've got the how part A, and now we have the how part B. But once you get that organized, then somebody says, okay, what do I do now? So then you go, well, what's next? What's the very next thing I need to do? You know, I'm going to put on my underwear first, and then I'm going to put on my socks. So then, then you have a next action. So, you know, I just identified these five stages, but they're very different stages. Your mind does very different things. The intention is the driver of it. The, the vision is the outcome thinking part of it. The, the how part A is the is a sort of creative brainstorming part of it. The how part B is the more linear kind of, okay, how do I organize or structure this? And then, you know, the, the, there's the how and then there's the now. What's the very next action? That actually goes to the limbic part of your brain that says, let me act on this. How do I move on this right now? So it's natural. But interestingly, you know, as I've studied a lot of the cognitive science research that's been done in the last decade or so, these actually are very different parts of your brain. The vision part of your brain comes from the frontal cortex, but the, but the action part of your thinking comes from the limbic part of your brain. They're two different things. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> people have to sort of train themselves, they have to train a cognitive muscle to actually think this way about stuff that's not just evident and right in front of you. So, you know, it's like, why is natural not normal? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't have a good answer to that other than what I just said. How do we start to train this then? Well, you start to do, put the model in front of you and take anything, your wedding, your, your, your you know, the podcast you're going to do and uh, anything you want to do the dinner what you want to cook, <clears throat> walk it through these five stages. Why am I doing this? What would wild success look like? What are all the things I need to consider? What kind of structure you know, do I need to have to can I make it happen? And then what's next? So all you have to do is walk yourself through the model about anything. And I've done it with, I spent thousands of hours with thousands of people actually walking them through this simple little model and produced incredible results. So thank you. And we're going to dive back into the model, but uh, I, I'm thinking back to wasn't necessarily my fourth grade. Actually, it's almost anything that I've written. Tell us about Mrs. Williams' fourth grade and frogs, because this for me is a killer. <laughs> well, hopefully not you know, a killer most, of frogs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, most of us learn to plan, at least in the U.S. Uh, educational system, um, about the fourth grade, about age nine or ten. That's when we learn to write reports. So I had Mrs. Williams in the fourth grade, and we learned to write reports. And of course, in order to teach us how to write reports, what did she teach us? Well, the first thing you ought to do is write an outline. Oh, okay. Let's create a structure for this report. You know, so I went home that night with the, my my task to write a report about frogs, and you start with frogs at the top, title at the top. Wow, I'm on a roll. Wow, how cool. And then Roman number one, and then I froze, as most people do. Roman number one. Oh my God. Ah! And by the way, you can't have just a one. <clears throat> if you have a one, you have to have a two. So you just can't have one thought. You have to have two equal thoughts simultaneously. You, couldn't, you can't even do that now, <laughs> much less when you were nine. Okay, so if I have a one, I have a two. And then you have some sub-thoughts, so one A. But you can't have, just have an A. You could have a B. You could have a C. You could have three, but not, not one, right? So... <clears throat> You, you had to have all these simultaneously already organized thoughts before you could actually start to do anything. And, you know, I had a standard about making good grades. So I said, okay, what do I need to do to make a good grade? And the way to make a good grade was just go to the encyclopedia and cop a bunch, copy a bunch of stuff, write a report about frogs, and then go back and then write the outline after the fact. Then I could turn in my outline and my report, and Mrs. Williams gave me an A. Wow. Thank you, Mrs. Williams, for this key to how to, you know, have a plan, well planned, well organized life. And unfortunately, <clears throat> that seems to have gotten translated to how a lot of people try to approach, you know, their world in terms of plannings and projects. Hi, let's get started with Roman one. Ah, no, I don't think so. So if we go back to natural rather than what's normal, and normal is go into a business meeting and all of a sudden it's Roman numeral one time and everybody is glazed over. Yeah. Yeah, who's got a good idea here, right? So a, a lot of the challenge that people bring me is they say, I have trouble creating 
a vision. And I believe a part of that is because we've been squashed. And so we're not allowed to create our own vision. We instead need to go to the outline. How do we help people to start envisioning in this process again? I don't know, Michael. I mean, over the years, I've just asked people, say, hey, what would it look like if this were wildly successful? I just ask the right question. And people don't seem to have a whole lot of problem about that, though you could spend a good bit of time. And most people, once they have that picture, they start, they start to develop further pictures, then they start to develop further pictures, and they start to recognize what they're really looking at. And so oftentimes they uncover a lot of stuff that they they sort of know intuitively, but they hadn't made conscious yet. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's just focus on, hey, what would wild success look like? What would wild success for this podcast be? What would wild success for anybody, anything you're doing, for dinner, for getting dressed, for whatever? And so training yourself to think at that level of game, that's something that doesn't seem to come, we don't seem to be born doing that. I mean, I guess we are, because we, we're always thinking of stuff we want or stuff we need or things we have intentions about. But starting to craft and frame you know, a vivid picture of what it is that we want. And not just the things we want, but what we want to be experiencing. You know, if you're going on a vacation, anybody listening or watching this has got vacation or holiday coming up on your radar anywhere. It's like, why? You know, first question, why are you taking a vacation? What's the purpose? And once you clarify that, then, hey, what would, what would be a really way wicked cool vacation be, sound, or feel like? And not only the things that you'd be doing, but how would you like to feel? How would you like, to, what would you like to experience with all that? So, you know, visioning can include your emotions and your internal and subjective experiences and results, as well as your physical ones. Excellent. So let's, let's shift gears from there slightly. You were talking about at the very begin, beginning, the mind is meant for having ideas, not for holding them. If we go back, you talked about to us about four things, the specific, the number, the four. 45 years ago, you stretched that to six. What can you tell us about that, and what's that mean for us? The brain can handle about four things, although, you know, one of my coolest jobs is being a, a waiter in a very, very shishi, informal, cool French restaurant out in West L.A. Uh, I waited on Robert Redford. I waited on... Uh, all kinds of cool folks because it was a, one of those kind of out of the way and people didn't bother people who were famous and whatever. It was really it was a really cool place. So the cool thing in that restaurant was to see how big an order you could take without writing anything down. You know, stand there, hands clasped behind your back, casual, elegant, you know, slightly snobbish. Well, this evening, madam, I think, oh, thank you. Very good. And I could take a full dinner order for six people. Couldn't do seven. Six was it. But, I mean, we're talking appetizers, entrees, stuff to drink. Me making recommendations between the lines. Well, oh, madam, you might prefer, and ah, oh, very good, madam, good choice. And I could do that, right, for about 25 seconds. You know, I would take that order and then I would casually, elegantly walk back to the kitchen, get behind the kitchen door, and grab the pen and paper and write it all down as fast as I could because I'd maxed out. <clears throat> so, I, I, so I discovered back then there was, there, was, there was a limit to how much of that, you know, that, that, that you could actually do. But it was interesting. It was kind of a fun way to train myself. So, awesome. And you talk about you talk about the mind as the head office, and you say that the brain sucks as an office. So, how do we start to? I want to talk about building space, about the concept of mind like water. How do we start to build space or give the room inside our minds we need? Well, first of all, you got to dump what's in your mind out of your mind. That's just called write it down. Oh, I need cat food. I need a life. I need a new wife. I need a, I, I, you know, I've got to, I got to fix the, my tire on my car. I'm like, I, uh, uh, you know, I really thought about it. I, I really, we're out of double A batteries. I need, you know, Indiana. you know, get it all, grab it all. That's the first step is just identifying the things that are banging around in there that are open loops or things that have your attention in some way, shape or form. Little, big, personal, professional, it doesn't matter. For most people, if I hold them to it, that takes anywhere from one to six hours usually just to just to just to unload that inventory, get it out of your head. So that's the first step is to do that. That and everybody already will feel a lot more space. Anybody listening to this right now, if you just stop, you know, turn this, turn off your TV or turn off your computer right now and, and just take a pen and paper and write down the 
top 10 or 15 or 20 things that come to your mind of the stuff you've got attention on, you haven't finished yet, you need to do something about, you'll start to feel more space already, right? So that's the first step, but you can't just leave it there because that stuff will crawl back up into your head if you, you don't sooner than later move to step two or three, you know, which is to clarify and organize what you just wrote down. So there's another couple of steps you need to do <clears throat> to create the space. So if you get, if we walk through a hypothetical example, somebody br dumps down everything that they want to get done on that paper, and they're like, oh, thank God. And then it starts to crawl back on them because they're going, now what? What do I do with this? Right, because they wrote down bank or mom <clears throat> or tooth or batteries or whatever. What they haven't done is decide exactly what those things mean to them. And what that, what is, what does it mean mean? It just means, okay, is that an actionable item? Yes or no? Right? If it is no, then you toss it, trigger it or tickle it for some later reminder about it, or you file it as reference. If it is actionable, yeah, I do need batteries. Yeah, I do need to get cat food. Yes, I do need to, you know, figure out what to do about whether I should get divorced or not then you need to decide, okay, <clears throat> what's the very next step you need to take? Mm -hmm. If you had nothing else to do but get closure on that thing and close that loop, where would you go? What would you do? Would you surf the web? Would you talk to somebody? Would you buy nails at the store? What's the very next thing you would need to do? And by the way, once you clarify what the next thing you need to do is, <clears throat> then the question would be, will that one thing finish it? Oh, no, it won't finish it. Great, then what's the project or what's the outcome? So now we're into action and outcome thinking, which is actually the cognitive thought process you actually have to apply to mom, to bank, to divorce, to, you know, podcast, to new career, to, you know, problem with your tooth, whatever, whatever any of that is, you then need to decide, okay, what's the next action and what's the project that I need to complete about this, if anything. So that's the clarification step, which is really important and, and, <laughs> and not that easy. I mean, it would take most people one to six hours just to identify all the things they need to think and decide about, and then the rest of two days to actually do that thinking and decision making about what's the next step about cat food, what's the next step about researching to get a divorce or not, what's the next step about your tooth problem, you know, and answering those questions. So then step three would be if they answer the question called, oh, tooth, you know, you know, I ought to really maybe call the dentist, make an appointment, great. So now I've got call dentist as an action step I need to do. And now if you can't call the dentist that very minute, then where are you going to park that reminder? <clears throat> so then you need some sort of trusted external brain system that you can park reminders of these things you've told yourself you need, would, could, should, ought to do when you have the appropriate context or time to do them. And that's what the, the step three is, the organized step. Let me organize the results of my thinking into some sort of trusted place. And that's... That then is going to get a lot of stuff off your mind, but then in order to keep that stuff off your mind, you have to go to step four on some consistent basis, which is look at all the stuff. <laughs> you need to look at your list. Look at your, when you go out for errands, why don't you look at all the six errands you've come up with over the last week that said, I need to go buy nails at the hardware store. I need to drop you know my shirt off at the tailor. I need to yada, yada, whatever all those are. Then you need to review and, and, and assess the content of your commitments at this level of clarification. And that's step four, which is review and reflect on the content of the gestalt of the whole game. And re review and, and, and reflect can take on a lot of forms. It could be review your life purpose, review the vision of success in your life, review your strategic plan, review your job description, review all your projects that you have to, you know, yada, yada. So there's, there's a lot of uh, the content here, are these multiple levels of our commitments that you need to review. And then step five just says, okay, now where do I put my attention and my activity? How do I engage? Do I take a nap? Do I have a beer? Do I, do I go to the hardware store? Do I, what do I do right now? Do I sit down at the computer and try to draft this proposal for the bank? So that's where you need to then look at the whole thing. So those are the five. That's how you get your anything sort of more clear and under control and get you more space is to you know, capture, clarify, organize, reflect, and engage. It's how you get your kitchen under control is how you get your consciousness under control. Let's, but we're not born doing it. <laughs> let's talk about a few a few of the potential challenges and and how we overcome it. And and I'm going to deal. I, and I do have some good techniques, but but I want to get your take on it. 
I, if I'm given a giant list, I end up going into glaze mode. So if my assistant gives me a list of people to email and I just have a list, it's too much the the whatever shuts down the processor hits hits the overwhelm button on me. How do we move past that? Well, ever go to a restaurant that's got a big menu? Oh yeah. Is that fun? No. Or is that not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I so, say, yeah, decision make mode. This is Steve Jobs having one white shirt or, or one one <laughs> pair of clothes to wear. Get that decision making down. Yeah, really. Yeah, no. So, but again, it's just a big menu of things to pick from. Yeah. And, you know, there's lots of filters you could put on this. You know, the main filter I put on it is which one of these things. I, there's two approaches, and I, I I flip between them. One is what's the most fun thing I could do. What would the, what would be the coolest call to make of this list? Yeah. And the other is which one am I avoiding the most that would give yes. me the most space if I actually got it off the list? And you know you could add a third to that. Well, which one of these things will would provide the greatest value if it's completed? That's which one of these things, if they were done, would provide the greatest value? And that value might be fun and it might be, you know, get the pressure off because it's a nasty, one of those ugly phone calls you're going to make. So thank you. On that note, the next thing that people always say is, and, and, and I can see it coming, quote, I don't have time. I don't have time to drill down on all of these things. And your response is? Fine. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to convince anybody to do anything different. I'm just an educator. I'm just here to tell you, look, if you want a clear head, you're going to have to do this. Sorry. You want, a, you want a car that runs? You're going to have to do stuff that makes sure that your car runs. You've got to put gas in it. You have to spend time. You have to, you have to invest in that. So there's some level of investment that you are going to have to do about this stuff unless you just want to let yourself be driven by latest and loudest and hope it all shows up all right. When I drive my car and I park it in the garage, I know I grab my plug, press a button, open it up, plug it in, and the car is charging. It's a micro habit, sort of like your gauge goes to close to empty. There's a certain point at which you start scanning for stations. How right. do we put micro habits in place so we can take it out of the conscious mind and easier to say, when this, I will do that? Mm, your physical environment helps a lot. You know, so building, you know, I've got two major habits. One is that I get stuff out of my head. And second is I empty my entries and inputs and backlog on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. That gets me to make a whole lot of decisions I just don't want to have to make because I can't stand looking at that stuff still sitting in my entry. So I'm looking at right now an empty entry right now, which is lovely. I just love that feeling. But when stuff lands in that, it creates this sort of dissonance for me. Not that I do it that every hour, every day, but, you know, but every 24 to 48 hours, I just have to sort of clean up all the backlog. So building those kind of habits, once you get used to a clean head, you know, you can't stand not having that stuff, you know, cleared up and captured and clarified and organized. You just couldn't, you can't stand it. So the real issue is, is sort of raising your internal standards. You know, you have an internal standard about, you know, electricity for your car. Right. And, and that it's going to run and that it works and whatever. And so at a certain point, you pass your comfort zone. Oh, my God. You know, any, 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 it's out of your comfort zone. So I'm out of my comfort zone. If I have longer than about a day or two of emails or stuff in my physical entry that have not been dealt with or processed. So when I'm not doing anything else, I'm cleaning that up because I love that feeling. So it's just that feeling of clarity and space that I got used to. You could call it addiction if you want, but you know it's not a bad addiction, right? And and so, yeah, that that's 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 what drives me to make a whole lot of other decisions I don't want to make. Is there a specific? It's interesting you say when I have the time I will do that. When people are, and this may get into this whole concept of space, when people are in the go 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 mode, which obviously we want to back things off of. It's the whole concept of being in a business versus on the business. Do we engineer in time to get that done? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's been my game since I was born was process improvement. Well, how much lazier can I be? 
why do we have to do this that way? Isn't there an easier way to do that? I, I wake up thinking that way. I'm not a naturally organized guy. I'm just a naturally lazy or efficient guy, whichever word you want to use. I just hate rethinking anything, and I hate having. To, I hate wasting time and energy, you know, simply because you know things are not structured appropriately for me to deal with them. So, putting all that stuff on cruise control, meaning you know, hey, it's in front of the door, so I'm going to remember it, <laughs> you know, when I walk out. Uh, so those are all just techniques, I think, that that allow us to then operate within a larger framework of space. But you, you, it, it's not free. You got to work on them. Thank you do you. have to invest in it. On that note, since since one of the things we're talking about is decision making isn't free, it takes an, a, an energy, there may be a limited resource. What do we need to know about willpower as well? Uh, <laughs> you only have a certain amount, and you know it's a muscle that you that you can deplete fairly easily. Mm -hmm. So you know decision fatigue is a very real thing. They've now studied that. Uh, willpower itself is a great book. You know, uh, John Turney and, and Ralph and, and Roy Baumeister, a, a wonderful book where they did a lot of research on how much energy it takes to actually make decisions. So basically, if you have a lot of tough decisions to make during the day, don't even don't even kid yourself that you're going to have any kind of willpower the, the, the late afternoon or evening to do anything you think you should do. You know, you've, you're, you, you've used up your 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 battery. So you, we need we need refreshment for the, the mind. And that's another thing the cognitive scientists have realized. I always thought I was just lazy, but it turns out I'm smart. That is, I, I like to sleep as long as I can sleep. I love to take naps. I love to daydream. I love to just, you know, walk around and be spontaneous. And I discovered now the cognitive scientists have said, yes, that makes you smarter. <laughs> and, you know, you're able to make better decisions. You know, if you have a, re if you're able to relax and stop that on, 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 go, 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 go kind of energy and pressure on your brain, you can only do that about four hours. I think the studies have shown you, you know, if you're trying to write a novel or trying to do anything that's, that's going to take a lot of creative focus, you got about four hours max in a day and don't, don't even assume you can even do any more than that. Well, your goose is cooked. Let's go from there. Dr. <laughs> Atul Gawande, the checklist manifesto. What can you tell us? Yeah, well, Atul is great. I mean, he's a champion of my stuff. And, and you know, he just, you know, he's this practicing surgeon who's who realized that doctors uh, could save a lot more lives if they actually used a checklist to make sure they washed their hands, to make sure that, you know, all things were done appropriately in the operating room, et cetera. And how many, how many people are at risk if you have somebody of that stature that's not following a checklist and the checklist not only allow you to be a lot more um, sure that you're going to do excellence in something uh, that your brain then doesn't have to try to remember and remind of all the steps you need to do about anything. But not only, not only that, it, once your brain trusts there's an appropriate checklist, like, Oh, there's a lot of other cool things that gives you the freedom to think about. You know, I'd use the example, if you have a really good checklist of all the stuff you need to buy when you go out shopping, it gives you the freedom to wander around and buy stuff that's not even on the list, <laughs> right? If you don't have the list, you're just, just sitting there trying to remember what's on the list. No, have a list and then relax and be spontaneous. Follow your intuitive, intuitive hunches, yeah. I never thought about it until just now. I have, uh, obviously, a checklist at the start of the show, so I'm not going, uh... What do I need to ask David about? What do we need to? Oh, well, wait, I should check the mic. Uh, well, uh, what do I? Oh, wait, I should. And then you start the show and you'd be going, oh, my God, I forgot to turn on the recorder. So yeah. it, it, it not only gives you a mental space, but one of the things that I didn't think of till just now is it puts you in. I don't know why I'm thinking of an astronaut going through the checklist, and then afterwards, you're ready to go into orbit. It puts you in a special space. So going through my checklist is almost like a self-hypnosis process. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 4. By the time I get to 1, it's showtime, and I'm ready to go just because of the checklist. Yeah. Well, Atul makes the point that pilots use checklists. Surgeons don't because surgeons are, you know, pilots are in the plane. So if you had to operate on yourself, trust me, you're going to want to, you're going to want to check this. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's go from there to the organized mind by Dan Levin. Yeah. Um, and Dan just, you know, he came up with 
basically the same thing that most all the cognitive scientists have come up with, which is the external brain. So he gives the example of putting stuff in front of the door, you know, making sure you build triggers in there so your mind is not bothered by all of that. It's funny, Dan, you know, told me, he said, you know, when he was halfway, he, he, he'd written the book and, and, and or he first draft, I think, and, he, and then he ran across my book and then he sort of freaked out. He went to his editor and said, oh my God, you know, do I even need to write the book? Because you know, David nailed it. And thank goodness he went ahead and did because he has a lot more stuff in there than is in my book in terms of the research and the, and the detail in terms of cognitive science stuff that he's involved in. Uh, but yeah, Dan, smart, smart guy and, and really good stuff. The organized mind. Yeah, it's how to stay sane, you know, put stuff in front of the door. So it's one thing. So I'm going skiing for my first time after this interview, this uphill skiing thing. First thing I needed to do, I needed to go through your, your five points because I need to envision and see what it's going to be like. What's my purpose? What do I hope to achieve? What, and go through, have a vision of this so I know what I need to bring with me. Then before the interview, I'm taking things and putting them by the proverbial front door so I have the bandwidth during this show. Right. Well, it, it's it's all about just being present. I mean, getting things done is not so much about getting things done as it is about just being appropriately engaged with your life so that you'll be fully present with whatever you're doing. That's the most productive place to operate from, the most fun place to operate from, the healthiest place to operate from. So people say, gee, David, you know, do you, don't you ever have any fun? I said, this is not fun. Come on. If you've got a, if you're present, there's no difference between work or play. It's just what's next. They're just, you're on, you're in your zone. So being in your zone. And again, that was something I got used to and wanted to maintain and, and make sure I knew how to get there. And that's where, that's how all this methodology that I uncovered came to be. What can you tell us about uh, Teo Compermole and Brain Chain? Yeah, Teo's an incredible guy. He's a practicing psychotherapist and MD and executive coach now in terms of stress. And Teo is a, a wonderful uh, Belgian uh, researcher. And he spent about, I don't know how long it took him, but he, he researched, he curated over 650 cognitive science research projects to uncover what was the what what are what some of the common themes and common denominators that that had shown up from all of that. And so he wrote it about, you know, basically the they call it brain chains, like chains around your brain that that most people are letting themselves get hung up about a lot of stuff that the brain is not really designed to do very well. So Thayer has he's got quite a few rants in there about, you know, kids and social media and the fact that people aren't resting their brain and not, not getting enough sleep and a lot of other things about that in terms of the, the, the brain. So a uh, great book, another, another really good book about, you know, um, what they've uncovered about what your mind is not good for. What do you do to rest your mind? My mind is pretty much at rest most of the time. You know, I love good massages. I love good wine. I love, you know, good food. I love hanging out, walk, just going for a walk. I love looking in nature, um, listening to music. Um, all those are, you know, fun things to do, things that, that help me sort of shift gears. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to keep my mind rested. You know, I think if you need a vacation, vacations and, and changing environments are really good just to shift perspectives. So I think we can all get stale if we stay in the same environment, stay staring at the computer. You know, you, you, you know, they know now every 90 minutes you ought to get up and walk around for five minutes, or get a cup of coffee or do something, you know, sort of shift your gears. So I think just shifting gears and keeping it some, something of a, of a rhythm of, uh, well, I plan as little as I can get by with. I just like to do what I feel like doing. So um, sometimes the most relaxing thing is to sit down and handle an ugly email. <laughs> that I'm just going to have to answer, but I, was like, I get into it and I go, okay, yeah, that was smart. That was a good way to deal with that. And so, you know, there's there really, I don't really make a big distinction between fun and not fun. It's, I, I like that you talk about getting to the, the uncomfortable email. It's a concept that I teach people, uh, relationships is a favorite area, to lean into the discomfort because you find pa it pops. There's something more comfortable on the other side, and there's a lot less bandwidth by, that's been taken up by the, well, what if, and I wish I had, and if only I, instead you've moved through it. Yeah, way out through, yeah, indeed. 
So you, you mentioned the term shifting gears a minute ago. I'm curious, as you're shifting gears to this portion of your life, and obviously you've got a big event coming up, we'll talk about that in a second, what's most interesting and exciting to you right now? I think it's, yeah, Michael, it's a good question. Uh, uh, probably the fact that we've been able to structure and scale our education about this getting thing done methodology to on a global level, and that it's got its own life that I could get run over by a bus and I think GTD will still be around a hundred years from now just because of the quality of people who've been attracted to this, who've made this now part of their life and work and who are spreading the word and very creative, very smart people. And, uh, and you know, that's really fun. And I, you know, I've got an incredible network. I mean, I've been so graced to have the people most attracted to my work, the people who need it the least, <laughs> they're already the most, proactive, positive, aspirational, you know, uh, folks around. They just already, they just know the value of system already. They, and they, they, they all want to have more space to do more of their good stuff. And so those are the kind of people that I'm, that I get to hang out with. <laughs> They're tend to attract to this. So, so it's a great quality of life to be able to then engage with those folks. I'll be in South Africa next week with our new partner there, who's a practicing psychotherapist. And uh, just an absolutely wonderful guy, he and his wife, and they're starting to, you know, spread this into Southern Africa. And wow, how cool is that? Very cool. What is the, um, and you haven't been there before, which makes it even, even cooler. Mm -hmm. what, what is, um, what are you reading about at present or what's most exciting to you right now? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, do, 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 do. What I'm, actually I'm reading right now, you, you're not you're not that smart or you're not as smart as you think. I forget the, the exact title of the book. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, a, lo a lot about how, how our decision, we think they're rational decisions, but they're actually made off of, you know, a lot of unconscious programming that's happened, you know, internally. And the book before that fabulous book called the antidote, you know, uh, you know, keys for people that so, sort of the antidote cures for people who are sick of the self-help motivational game. You know, and so a lot about, you know, come on, guys, no more rah, rah, you know, total optimism. You got to there's a lot of dealing with current reality that you need to you know, sort of integrate. So a lot of is fast. Actually, the book is much more um, in depth than the, than the title sounds. But th those are both you know fascinating and inspiring to me. But very validating, actually, a lot of what we do, because I'm not a motivational speaker. First of all, I sleep as long as I can, and I'm not a rah-rah, you know, come on, as, as high as you get emotionally, that's how deep you're going to depress yourself. So, you know, I, I'm into doing small little steps incrementally that, that, that start to build, you know, power and, and, and value in your life. And the, you don't even have to like your life to get it off your mind. You know, I just figured out what, what you need to do to get it off your mind, and then, then you'll find out you actually probably do like your life because with a clear head, you'll start to recognize more of who you are and who you want to be. And, you know, that's, that is a motivational process. But I'm not the guy who's going to try to get you to do that. I'm just the guy that can tell you the things that you might want to engage with that might make that clearer and freer for you to get into that space. What would you say, thank you, what would you say is a first step well, you talk, you talk about in one of your TED Talks about how a, quote, dumb ant can accomplish so much. How do we take one step to becoming more like that ant and emptying our mind right away? Well, you need to build the habits, as I mentioned before, that are the keystone habits. And the keystone habit is out of your head yeah. and decide a next action about whatever you got out of your head sooner than later. And those two things, if you just build those two things into your life, you know, believe me. And then you park the things in the appropriate places. Because the whole idea of the dumb ant is, is the, that the ant, you know, once it, in its environment, it's, it has evolved. So in its environment, the environment triggers what it needs to do next. Right. And so if you, like me, park your, all the errands that you tell you come up what's the next action oh i need to buy that hardware store oh yeah hardware store yeah all right so if you've got if you park that in an errand list mm -hmm. you've forgotten you know five days ago that you even wrote that down but you're going out for errands and you pick up this list called errands and you see hardware stores oh yeah well that's the ant 
dropping a pheromone. That so you just dropped something in your life so that when you came back around and looked at your errand list, it triggered an activity that you came up with before. So it's it's kind of like you were. See, you're you're not smart. That I, I hate to tell you this, Michael, but you and I we we're, we're not that smart all the time. You know, inspiration and inspiration and intelligence are rare things. So when you're smart and inspired, you make a decision. Hey, the next step is go to the hardware store. Hey, that's smart. That's an intelligent thing. You park that somewhere so that you can be kind of dumb and thick, and you go to the hardware store and actually get something. So you actually do a smart thing, but you don't have to be smart to do it. <laughs> you were smart once, and then you park the result in an appropriate place so that you can be kind of thick and dumb and you get smart things done. If you were to give people a homework assignment today, would it be to start to get to do a brain dump, or where would people begin? Yeah, that's the first place. Just get a pen and paper and just empty your head as best you can. Uh, I mean, our first step is, you know, if you, if you haven't read Getting Things Done, get a copy of Getting Things Done and read it, you know, or at least skim through it so you can at least see what this whole game kind of is like and where you might want to be getting to. But yeah, that'd be the first step. If I were to coach anybody, I, I, they said, hey, can help. We'd, I'm just going to get a big pile of printer paper. Just eight, you know, with letter size printer paper, and a, and make sure they've got a good pen. And say, okay, let's go. And every single thought's going to go on a separate piece of paper. First of all, we're going to get them an in basket because a lot of people don't even have one, or if they have one, it's decayed or died or petrified. So we get a nice clean in tray, and we just start dumping all those things down. One piece of paper, one thought. One piece of paper, one thought. One piece of paper, one thought. And we're just going to do that till it's empty. And there is an end to it, by the way. A lot of people say there's no end to this. Yes, there is. Just keep going until there's nothing left. And that may take anywhere from one hour. to. I've had it take up to a day or two, you know, for some people, just given how many things they were engaged in, how many open loops they created in their life. But take as long as it takes. That's going to be a first step, and that's healing in and of itself. And then if you still have the discipline to, to do it, then go through every one of those pieces of paper and say, gee, what is this? Is what's the next action on this? And then, then have some sort of a place to park the results of that thing. How do you, I'm picturing this mountain, <laughs> empire state building worth of paper. How do you can take your next and get action and get action and get action and get action down? How do you determine out of this mountain how to prioritize these? Well, <laughs> do this first. And then you won't have any choice. You won't have any problem. Believe me. I've never had anybody, once they got it all out of their head, not go, oh, wow, well, that, not that. It just most people can't make those kind of choices because they got so much stuff banging around in their crappy office in their head. Makes sense. They, 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 don't have, they don't have clarity. Once you get that stuff clear, you may make a wrong choice, but at least you'll be making a much more trusted choice about what you do once you've seen the totality of the game. Thank you. On that note, any advice you'd give to parents to helping their kids with getting things done? Well, as soon as they're old enough to understand what's the outcome we'd like to have for the party or the, the event or, or, you know, whatever. And gee, uh, you know, what, what would wild success really look like for you? How would you feel? What would, what would this be? Great. Well, we're not there yet. What, what do you think we need to do? What, what's the next thing we need to do to make sure that that happens? As soon as they're old enough to have that conversation and come up with any kind of answers, that's as old as they need to be to start to be trained to think outcome and action. Beautiful. So we've seen kids four, four, five, six, eight years old, you know, doing this. They can get it. On that note, what personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? Uh, when I. I, I guess when I get somebody, and we have legions of testimonials of people that go, God, David, I read the book and I started to implement this, and oh my God, this really changed my life. I was able to manage my mom's elder care. I was able to actually, <laughs> a woman who was like in her late 80s, she said, David, I read your book. I started to implement it. I was able to keep my own house instead of give it up. I was able to still manage my own life the way I wanted to manage it. Those are the kinds of things. God, you can't, you can't buy that. I mean, those are... Those are the golden goodies in my life is when I see people. And, and also particularly when people, you know, I love helping people who are helping people. So any, any chance I can do, I try to give pro bono, you know, whatever this is to anybody that's doing really, really, really good work out there so that they can do it more sustainably and in, in a better way. So when I hear, you know, the great stories of folks like that, 
you know, who get this and then are able to have a much more sustainable um, way of living and working and keeping on, you know, doing that good work that they're doing. Boy, they're not much more fulfilling than that. Awesome. On that note, where can people go to find your phenomenal work and a once of a kind event coming up? Well, you can go to gettingthingsdone.com. That's to, to give you a, a large gestalt, essentially, of what our business is. And and if you go to our partners, uh, the link on our partners, I don't do a lot of delivery of our training and our coaching, but we now have partners in 60 countries around the world. So depending on where you are around the world, you can go check in on that and see where there are, you know, who the partner is that's in your area. And they're doing, almost all of them are doing public seminars. They're doing introductions to this. So you know, connect in with our network out there of people who are really good at this. And we've, we've maintained, you know, we, we certified the master trainers in these regions. So the quality control is pretty high in terms of, of, of this work. So that's it. And then we have a, we're doing a, <laughs> a one only kind of a summit I, because we've gone so global and this movement has really become a global movement. We wanted to sort of bring together at least have one event in my lifetime. At 73, I don't think I'll do another one of these. But, you know, that the, the, we 10 years ago, we did one in San Francisco just to raise the flag and see who saluted of uh, the people around the world who had sort of taken the GTD because there were such cool folks. And, I mean, uh, multiple different industries and levels and, and, and interests. But they all sort of shared this common denominator of interest in this, you know, this methodology. So we said, uh, you know, about 18 months ago, we said, okay, I think it's time to do this again. Uh, my wife goes, ah, no, you know, <laughs> these are not not easy things to do. And we found some uh, a couple of great partners who have done these kind of conferences in Amsterdam before. And we're doing it in Amsterdam, which is much more the center of the world, you know, than I was in Santa Barbara. Uh, but so we plan on up to fifteen hundred people, you know, showing up. And we've already got, you know, I ask, I ask, you know, my A list of people that I asked to be presenters, if they'd be willing to do that on their own dime. And we got oversubscribed. We have over 40, over 40 presenters now who are coming from all over the world. You know, really cool folks, people like Marshall Goldsmith, you know, one of the you know, top executive, you know, probably the top executive leadership coach in the world. Katie Coleman, you know, one of the first women astronauts, you know, uh, and just a great, so if you go to gtdsummit.com, you'll see, uh, I think I, right now we've got about 30 or 34 of the speakers or presenters up on the, you know, up on the site. And so you can just get a sense of what that's going to be like two days, June, 2021 in Amsterdam. Uh, so, you know, look it up if it rings your bell, love awesome. to have you. So if you didn't catch gettingthingsdone.com and gtdsummit.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com. We'll get you over to gettingthingsdone.com and you can check out gtdsummit.com. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with us today, David? Relax. The world is fine. It's not confused. It's not overwhelmed. It's only our relationship to it that creates those sort of things. So, you know, there's a, there's a way to get there. So, you know, God bless. Good luck. All the best. Thank you so much, David. You know, you are a, a walking, talking epitome of <laughs> zen and organization. <laughs> Still like uh, water. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it didn't come free. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much, David. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get getting things done, and begin freeing your mind today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, David. Thanks, Michael, for having me back. That's great. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>